For centuries, people claimed the Bible held the blueprint of the universe. Six days of creation, a world only a few thousand years old, a first man made from mud, a first woman from his rib, a single couple who birthed the entire human race, heaven above the dome, held beneath the ground. It was neat, it was simple, it was wrong. Because when science arrived, not as an enemy, but as a method of seeing more clearly, the Bible's world cracked apart. Every discovery stretched the horizon wider than scripture could hold, until the old stories collapsed under the weight of evidence. This isn't a story of science versus faith in the abstract. It's the story of how science destroyed the Bible's worldview by replacing it with something bigger, deeper, and truer. Geology and physics broke the timeline. Evolution dismantled the handcrafted human. Genetics exposed the myth of a single couple. Mythology revealed Yahweh's borrowed roots, astronomy, flattened heaven and hell into metaphors. The Bible's categories made sense to flat earth thinkers staring at the sky and digging into the soil. But the universe we now see is vast, multidimensional, and indifferent to our myths. Religion remains bound to its local metaphors. Science universalizes. And in that expansion, the Bible's fragile framework was undone. Let's start with the beginning. The Genesis narrative doesn't just tell a story. It sets a timeline, a six-day creation, and a genealogy from Adam to Noah to Abraham. These were meant to give a complete chronology of the world. The early interpreters of Genesis assumed the cosmos was fresh, measured in thousands of years, not millions. Bishop Usher famously calculated creation to have occurred in 4004 BCE, reflecting how seriously this young Earth model was once taken. In this worldview, Earth and humanity were central, unique, and recent. Modern science cracked this open from multiple directions. Geology revealed rock layers and fossils stacked in sequences that stretched back hundreds of millions of years. Radiometric dating gave precise ages for rocks, meteorites, and even the Earth itself at about 4.5 billion years. Astrophysics and cosmology pushed the horizon further, showing a universe about 13.8 billion years old. Each of these fields independently dismantled the short chronology. What once seemed like a tight origin story was overwhelmed by a timeline vast beyond human imagination. Confronted with the data, religious thinkers tried to re-engineer Genesis into alignment with science. Some tried the day-age theory. Each day of creation is really a long epoch, stretched to fit geological time. Some tried the gap theory, a long pause between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, which allows for an ancient universe before the six days. There's even the theistic evolution, where God used evolution and natural processes, but still authored the story. All these moves are defensive. They don't emerge from the biblical text itself, nor from scientific discovery, but from the pressure to keep both. Instead of building an evidence-driven model, they retrofit an ancient myth to fit a modern framework, patchwork theology in survival mode. But let's talk about human creation. Genesis imagines humanity's beginning as a kind of sacred pottery session. Adam sculpted from dust, animated by divine breath, and then Eve carved from Adam's side. This imagery is earthy, tactile, and deeply tribal. Human beings as handcrafted artifacts, not as part of a living continuum. In this model, humanity is separate from nature set apart from animals and uniquely imbued with divine spark. The rib detail is especially telling. It suggests hierarchy, woman derived from man and intimacy, flesh of my flesh, a myth that shapes not only origin stories, but gender roles across centuries. Evolutionary biology reframes this completely. Humans are not clay dolls, but branches on a vast evolutionary tree with genetic evidence linking us to chimpanzees, gorillas, and beyond. Genetics shows inheritance is polygenic and complex. Traits come from countless interactions, not one-to-one -one transfers. The rib story collapses under the weight of modern DNA evidence. When is the last time you saw a rib become a person? Fossil records map our lineage across millions of years through Australopithecus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus and beyond, revealing gradual development rather than sudden appearance. Where Genesis imagines instant artistry, science reveals a long, intricate process of natural selection, mutation, and adaptation. I often like to call this the mud and rib model. 
A sharper framing might be the handcrafted creation model. Now, this name highlights the contrast. In Genesis, humans are manually assembled by divine intervention, while science shows we are the result of impersonal but elegant evolutionary processes. One is a myth of separation and superiority. The other is a narrative of continuity and connection. This underscores how religion framed human origins in isolation, special, handmade, and fixed, while science embedded us in a shared evolutionary story. The clash here isn't just about biology, it's about identity. But there is another problem with Adam and Eve. It's not just the creation of the couple, it's also the implications of a founding couple. At the heart of Genesis is the idea that all humanity descends from a single pair, Adam and Eve. This single couple origin anchors doctrines like original sin, mortality, and the need for salvation. The logic is simple. If one couple fell, everyone inherits their guilt. This primal pair myth functions as a genealogical bottleneck, explaining both the universality of the human experience and the universality of sin in Christian theology. It also underwrites patriarchal and hierarchical thinking. If humanity began in a nuclear family under God's authority, all future social order is meant to mirror that structure. But modern genetics dismantles the idea of a single founding couple. Population genetics shows that humanity has never dropped below several thousand breeding individuals. Our diversity cannot be traced back to only two people without genetic collapse. Mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosomal Adam are often misrepresented. They don't point to one literal couple, but rather to different common ancestors in separate genetic lineages. They didn't live at the same time, and they are not the biblical Adam and Eve. Evidence of interbreeding with Neanderthals and others further highlights the complexity of our ancestry. Humanity is a tapestry of populations, not a family tree rooted in two mythical figures. The science paints a picture of richness and depth, not a bottleneck, but a web of connections across tens of thousands of years. So whether you call it founding couple, primal pair, or a single couple origin, these terms capture the theological idea without giving undue legitimacy to it. Framing it this way also helps to highlight the tension between mythic simplicity and scientific complexity. This shows how religion shrinks humanity's origins into a myth of one couple and one fall, while science expands it into a vast interconnected ancestry. The myth insists on universality through exclusion. Science reveals universality through diversity. Let's talk about the divine beings. In the biblical imagination, divine beings fill the universe with hierarchy and power. Elohim, a plural word, hints at a pantheon before being represented as a singular God. Yahweh emerges as Israel's national deity, a jealous God who wages war, sends storms, and demands loyalty. Surrounding him are angels, heavenly messengers who serve as extensions of divine authority. On the surface, this looks like a distinct theology. One God, his chosen people, and his celestial servants. Comparative mythology reveals that these figures are not original creations, but borrowings and adaptations from older traditions. Elohim resonates with the Canaanite pantheon where El was the high god. Yahweh carries traits of storm and warrior gods like Baal and Hadad. His fiery presence, thunderous voice, and battles against chaos monsters echoes myths from surrounding cultures. Angels reflect the influence of Mesopotamian and Persian and even Egyptian traditions where divine messengers and cosmic intermediaries already played central roles. Anthropology and psychology add another layer. These beings mirror human needs. Authority is projected into a high God, security into protective angels, and cosmic order into heavenly hierarchies. What religion frames as revelation, science interprets as reflection, a mirror of human fears, hopes, and political structures cast onto the heavens. Instead of treating these as unique theological insights, we might describe this system as the borrowed pantheon model. What looks like divine originality is really mythological recycling. Yahweh's rise to supremacy is less about cosmic truth and more about cultural competition, one tribe's God elevated above all others, borrowing the language of power from its neighbors. This highlights how religion claims divine uniqueness, but science and scholarship reveal deep continuity with human culture. Where the Bible sees revelation, history sees evolution, a reshuffling of myths to serve new social needs. And this conversation would not be complete without talking about heaven and hell. 
Ancient religion mapped morality onto geography. The universe was imagined as a three-tiered cosmos, heaven above the dome, earth in the middle, and hell beneath the ground. As above, so below. This model spatialized morality. Virtue ascends, sin descends. Up meant closeness to God, light, and reward. Down meant separation, darkness, and punishment. The structure was simple, intuitive, and rooted in the everyday human experience of looking up to the sky and down into the soil. Heaven and hell weren't abstract ideas, they were real places in a vertical universe. Modern astronomy and physics dismantled this picture. Astronomy revealed the sky is not a dome, but an expanding cosmos filled with galaxies, stars, and planets. Physics showed that up and down are relative to one's position on Earth, not cosmic absolutes. Cosmology stretched the horizon, a universe 13.8 billion years old with no throne above or cavern below, just space, matter, and energy. The three-tiered universe was a map drawn on a flat Earth canvas. Once Earth was revealed to be a sphere orbiting the sun, and once space itself was seen as infinite and expanding, the geography of morality collapsed. In light of science, heaven and hell are no longer locations. They're terrestrial limitations, metaphors bound by above and below thinking. Instead of angelic heavens, we have galaxies, black holes, and nebulae. Instead of fiery caverns of torment, we have entropy and extinction, real phenomena, but in different ones. The universe doesn't moralize, it simply exists. If Genesis maps morality onto geography, science removes the map altogether. Reward and punishment are no longer written into the stars or the soil. They are human constructs projected onto a cosmos that is vast, silent, and morally neutral. This drives home how science didn't just disprove a few details, it rewrote the very shape of the universe. Religion's vertical map of up versus down shrank in the face of a universe where direction itself is relative, and morality is no longer cosmic real estate, but a human project. The Bible's worldview was built on local metaphors and tribal horizons, a flat earth, a short timeline, a handcrafted humanity, a primal pair, a borrowed pantheon, a vertical morality. Each of these models made sense in an ancient world where the sky looked like a dome, the ground seemed endless beneath the feet, and the boundaries of knowledge were defined by what a village could see or imagine. In that world, above and below carried moral weight, and the Bible's categories felt sufficient. Science did not kill the Bible with a single blow. It destroyed it piece by piece by expanding human perspective beyond its limited categories. Geology and astrophysics stretched time from thousands of years to billions. Evolution embedded humanity into the same tree of life as all other organisms. Population genetics shattered the myth of a single founding couple. Comparative mythology exposed Israel's God and angels as cultural recyclings, not divine revelations. Astronomy and cosmology replaced a three-tiered moral universe with an infinite, indifferent one. The Bible was not refuted so much as it was outgrown. Its models became too small for the universe we discovered. Its framework fit only as long as we didn't understand. The more we begin to understand, the less it reflected our reality. We are transitioning from local metaphors to universal knowledge. Above and below once felt intuitive, but only on a flat earth. In a universe where direction is relative, space is multidimensional, and life is not the center but a byproduct, the old categories collapse. Religion remains bound to its local metaphors while science universalizes. The cosmos does not conform to scripture. Scripture shrinks before the cosmos. When science destroyed the Bible, it did so not by attacking faith head on, but by rendering the Bible's worldview obsolete. What once seemed like revelation now reads like provincial myth. What once mapped the cosmos now looks like a child's drawing of the infinite. The universe has outpaced the book, and in doing so, has shown that truth is not found in clinging to ancient metaphors, but in expanding with the horizons of knowledge. Science didn't just challenge isolated doctrines. It exposed the entire biblical framework as too small for reality. Thank you so much for joining me today. Listen. 
I don't just want you to watch this channel. I want you to be a part of this community. You can support the work financially through Patreon, YouTube memberships, or even directly with Cash App, PayPal, or Venmo. You can also shop Window Shop for resources and merch that keep you growing and helps us stay strong. But beyond that, I want you to tap in. Use the form below to let us know you're interested in being a part of a local community. And if you're in or around Southern California, registration for our October gathering opens up this week. I want to see you there. And if you can't make it in person, meet me here every Sunday at noon. This is about more than belief. It's about building a better world together. Again, thank you for hanging out with me today. Until next time, keep rising.